Welcome to the show, Gold Squadron Gays. It's the podcast where Charles takes over the podcast for several weeks because Bradley has to go do his job or something stupid, so now Charles just gets to talk about legend books he likes. I'm your host, Charles Rogers, and with me is a guest who I'm pretty sure is not a zombie. A uh, guest who is not a zombie, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ryan. I, uh, I am undead. I eat brains. In addition, I host uh, Force Friends Rewatch with my good pal Andy, who was just on this show recently. I am super involved in uh, Legends Con, which is something that I think Charles is a little familiar with. A little bit weekend. familiar. <laughs> I may have spent a couple of hours at Legends Con <laughs> over the and weekend. more than a couple dollars. <laughs> uh, we don't need to talk about that on an audio medium where anyone, including my partner, could potentially be listening. They don't need to know about the, the <laughs> limited edition three of a kind Revan statue on my desk. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. The, it's it's from your booth. Is it? I, I've never I heard of one, such a thing. I know. I didn't I didn't encourage this. You didn't you didn't spend <laughs> days encouraging this. Oh. oh man, Legends Con was a blast, but we will get to that, won't we? We will we will get to that now, actually. I was gonna say Let's do uh it. we're we're here to talk about a book. We're here to talk about a legends book, fittingly oh, yeah. enough. And not anything which may be currently happening, as the AMPTP still will not get their heads out of their asses and do some actual negotiating with the WGA and SAG. So instead of talking about any of that, uh, Ryan, would you like yeah. to tell us, for the listeners, a little bit about what Legends Con is and why you and I spent multiple hours in the convention center in Burbank <laughs> talking about Star Wars books from 30 years ago? Oh, man. So uh, Legends Con is like a super positive space to talk about legends the original star wars expanded universe last year i would say like july my good friend Catherine, who is the executive director of the con and sort of the brains behind the operation, uh, hit me up and said, if I organized the Legends Con, would you be down to help out in the production capacity, make this thing happen? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> There's no way that goes smoothly. Uh, you know, don't let's not even go there. Um, but the ball kept rolling and eventually I got involved and I'm so glad I did. I mean, we had a uh, shoot. I don't even know where to begin with the guests. Randy Stradley and Jason Fry reached out to us and got involved. Uh, Randy was the big time like editor of all of Dark Horse's Star Wars for the most part from like 1990. I don't know. He was he was the editor of Dark, the Star Wars editor of Dark Horse for a long time. And Jason has written so much in both the new canon and Legends. And they like were cheerleading for us. And Legends Con went from this like little intimate hundred person airport hotel con to what you saw. I mean, there were hundreds of attendees, dozens of vendors. The panels, I think, were nonstop awesome. There was, was one really that was kind of eh, but you know. <laughs> Are the, you talking the, about the, your the panel? Characters panel? Yeah, I, I heard one of the hosts uh, spent way too long making his PowerPoint. <laughs> Uh, well, I heard no. the PowerPoint was amazing, so uh, good job. Thank you. Um, oh, man. It was a team effort. Yeah, you had oh, yeah. Uh, Barbara Hamley. Yeah, Bar we had, who, dude, we had uh, to send who someone. Who wrote some of the, the old EU stuff, and then Matthew <sighs> fucking Stover was there. Yes! Abel Pena, who was on my panel. Uh, Michael Kogi, I think is how you pronounce his last yeah, name. It is Kogi. Yeah. I, I spent <laughs> I spent all weekend hearing it, and then it just leaked right out of my brain. I'm so sorry, <laughs> Michael. Fantastic dude. I had loads of conversation oh, yeah. with him. He's the coolest. Uh, he's the he was the coolest dude. Like yeah. him and Abel, I had a lot of good conversations with them. Abel's uh, the best. Yeah, but you had a lot of really killer guests there. There was a yeah. lot of really killer booths there. The the local Lego adult fans of Lego, uh, they had a two table booth, a two yeah. three table. And every time I would walk by, there would be new ones. They would have set up new because the the guys were just sitting there building Lego, and <laughs> so then they would cool. have new models throughout. The uh, Mandalorian Mercs were there. Uh, Rebel Legion was there. 501st didn't have a booth, but made an appearance. No, they did. Uh, they had a booth uh, on the back side of the. Did they have a booth? Oh. Yeah. Okay. It was it was right. It was the first thing you saw when you walked into the hall. But you and I were usually bursting into the hall on some kind of mission, so we yes. usually ran right past. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I was either getting deputized <laughs> or I was trying to like visit some of the booths in between panels because I think I attended like eight of them, nine oh, of them man. over the course of, of oh, that's two awesome. days. Uh, we, uh, shout out, shout out to to the uh, Imperial Communique. 
I think. Yeah, Imperial Communique. Communique. That's a there, that's how you line. pronounce that word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Special shout out to Imperial Communique. I walked by that setup multiple times. Uh, and it's it's toys. It's a gentleman uh, and his wife, and he's been collecting toys since 1977. And so we had just lines of stormtroopers and imperial troopers, and I got to watch this grow over the course of the first day. Yeah. It was really cool. They they're very proud that they ran out of space at their hundred square foot display before they ran out of troopers to set up. <laughs> <laughs> and there was like there was like ATATs on the side. Yeah. There was like multiple, and then there were there was a lot of different artists. Uh, there was some people with lightsabers, of course. It generally it it was a great time. It was an absolutely was. great time. And you guys are planning on doing it again, right? We are. Uh, there is news forthcoming. We're still working out the exact where and when but uh we're definitely doing it again how could we not the first night honestly this like this really stuck with me my partner and i sat down with jason fry at the hotel to talk about some stuff regarding a panel shout here. out to becca soka for some of the coolest fucking cosplay oh and, absolutely and it was a, yeah it was a it was a stacked market uh but shout out to becca soka becca soka is the best that that is my partner um yeah she had uh bastila and mara jade and just playing all the legends hits you know yeah no J we sat down with jason she also became Jason Fry's drinking buddy, but I'll let her tell that story sometime on her own. Uh, the best panel of the con was Becca and Jason versus a bottle of Prosecco. Anyway. Um, <laughs> that is a good uh, name for a podcast. <laughs> That would be a good podcast. She's listening to me and from the other room and kind of looking at me. No, we sat down with him and we talked about, I mean, we talked about everything under the sun. We talked about the panel, but we, we talked about a lot. And towards the end, he told me that the reason he reached out and the reason he was so passionate about this event was that he felt that we could change the conversation around the expanded universe. I, last night, I actually told our PR team when we were talking about a social media thing, um, this is a wild analogy, buckle up. The Legends community has spent the last nine years locked in a state of, oh no, it's Thanksgiving dinner and grandpa just told us how he's going to fix the world. Like, yes, people are saying, yeah, people are saying off the wall stuff and I, you never I know who's... how good that is. <laughs> it sucks. And I said, Legends Con, I said, I said this after Jason said his bit, um, Legends Con has to be the cool cousin who has like a good job and stuff, but we'll still smoke weed with you in the garage. I... And and Jason said, like, Jason's much more scholastic take on it was this is an event that's poised to change that conversation. We could like what we do this weekend could set the tone for a total community shift. And that was absolutely terrifying. But I like to think that we did like we there was no occasionally people would make a comment like Filoni this or like the new movies that and I would say hey man like you know I like a lot of that stuff and that's not really what we're here to talk about and that was always where it ended people would be like yeah you're right you're right. And then we would redirect to like the Thrawn trilogy or something. I, I had uh, I had a handful of similar experiences, but, you know, it never it never got to a point uh, where I had to step in and be like, hey, you know, I actually kind of really like the new stuff. Yeah, uh, this is making me uncomfortable. Never got to that point. Never yeah. at all. And, and that's cool. It was it was a completely respectful time the entire time. And that was something that struck me, because if if you're spending a bunch of time not complaining explaining about how you think the old stuff measures up to the new stuff yeah. or what your opinion on the sequels are or what your opinion on stuff is, then you have time to just enjoy the, the parts of the old stuff that you really like. Yes. And I even saw like there were still people there that were cosplay. There was one dude didn't get a picture with him, really wanted to. This man dressed as sequel trilogy Luke both days. Yeah. He dressed as the uh, Jedi robes Luke the first day. And I was like, oh, that's neat. Someone here is actually dressed up as something from the sequel trilogy. And then the next day he dressed up as like fisherman Luke yeah. on Octo. And I was like, that's really cool that that's a space. It's a space to celebrate legends, but not pit legends against the current stuff. If you like the current stuff, there's stuff here for you too, that they were selling the books. And obviously like Jason Fry, Michael Kogi, these are people who have also written for, for the new stuff. And even yeah. fucking Henry Gilroy was there. Yeah. I got to ask Henry Gilroy a question. Would you? I, oh yeah. You asked him in my I, panel at the writing I, panel. At your panel at the, how to write good which the the super <laughs> secret document that i could never share with anyone now si is currently sitting on my desk that you i got can share it you can share it i, I don't the think question, we should go posting the it, question but. is well i want to share it i have a it, handful we, of people who may want to see it but oh, it, yeah. it was like that it was it was a space that i think that the con organizers 
And the general vibe there and the way the panels were moderated and the panels that were chosen and the guests that were chosen, all of that went a long way towards trying to keep the focus on let's celebrate all of Star Wars, the parts of Star yes. Wars that we love, all of these parts of Star Wars, you know, from the last ever since Splinter of the fucking Mind's Eye in 1978? Yeah. Was it 78? It was 78. Yeah, 78 yeah, yeah. 78 or 79. I think it was oh, no, it might have been 79. I don't know. It, it was it one of those two. It was those it was, first It was years. back there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought... I thought that was really cool. And I think so many times legends get just deployed in just a really negative way. And it's usually because yeah. it's deployed incorrectly. It's deployed as a weapon. Yes. It's deployed to bash something you don't like. And it's like, oh, this will never be as good as Knights of the Republic. Or this will never be as good as The Force Unleashed. And I'm like, why would you demean a thing you like that way? Yes, that's why. That's how the conversation started with Jason about changing the conversation. We were talking about being such huge fans of this stuff but then anytime you bring up legends like the conversation just becomes loaded because they're afraid you're gonna do that they're afraid you're one of those people and it like i don't want to be that but also i don't want those people to be that like i tried to kind of talk to people and be like because a lot of people say like i don't like the new canon and then you're like well mandalorian and they're like oh well that's and like well what about andor oh andor is amazing except there's a little bit that contradicts but i can okay so you do like the new stuff <laughs> there's you've just parts made of it this you like <laughs> yeah and you've just made this your identity but the, but the same happens in reverse like i i have a friend who insists that he doesn't like legends but then you're like well i mean you're all about knights of the old republic well yeah but that i mean that's a classic okay but the clone wars micro series well yeah i love that Okay. And like, didn't you read like, you know, the Republic comics a little bit? Well, some of them were good. Okay. So you, it's all Star Wars, dude. Like one of the most striking moments for me, Michael Kogi, uh, and it is indeed pronounced Kogi. Let's confirm okay. that again. That's um, Kogi. It he, is pronounced yeah. Kogi. <laughs> he, he talked me into hosting the uh, Many Lives of Luke Skywalker, which was four authors who have written Luke at very different points in his life. Barbara Hambly, Matt Stover, Michael Stackpole, and himself, Michael Kogi just talking about who Luke was. And it was really interesting. Uh, Barbara's not super familiar with the new stuff, but the rest of them seem to feel that like- Whatever Barbara's doing, she needs to keep doing it. Oh, I'm not going to tell her. her she needs to change a thing. Her <laughs> energy, whatever she's doing, keep doing yes. it. Dude, but sorry, months before, continue. No, it's all good. Months before the con, Barbara asked us permission to cosplay. And we were like, you do whatever you want. Oh, she was in Jedi robes oh, yeah. the, the whole time. time. And the whole the time. Staff and, oh, yeah. And she was so... I, I, I helped her park her car and then didn't recognize her with her Jedi hood up and complimented the costume. And she was just like, thank you. I... I really love this costume. Like she's the, oh man. I saw somebody said she had Sage Jocasta new energy. This That's person it. was correct. Yeah. Uh, I think either I was in this conversation or I was in this panel when this the, happened. I, it it I popped remember, up on Twitter. I think you probably saw the tweet. I probably saw I, it on I, Twitter. I, yeah, I think so I you were telling a story about the, the many oh, lives yeah, of sorry, the Skywalker sorry. panel, the one so, that ran late and the rest yeah. of us who were not at the panel had to stand outside for the closing ceremonies. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving Ryan shit. <laughs> I did ask every panelist and the stage manager permission. Um, no, that's so the most in this should tell you how well this fucking con was run. That's Shout out to part. Ryan and Catherine, the organizers. The fact I had to wait an additional five ish minutes <laughs> outside one panel for the closing ceremonies on the last day is the most <laughs> inconvenienced I was at this con. I, to, there are many more, Incredible. Organizers, by the way, there's I mean, there's Kyle who saved us from ruin at one point and really helped out the whole time. There's Patrick who just was invaluable there's Corinthia who was our exhibit manager there's, there's, there's many of them but anyway so yeah so we're talking about like Luke Skywalker through Legends and I forget if it was Stackpole or Silver or Kogi who brought it up but all three of them agreed there was a point in the Yuzhan Vong war where Luke totally could have fucked off to Akto like that was always right there and they they feel that it's weird that fans consider the the canon Luke to be different and it was really interesting that they brought that up on a stage at a Legends con and not a single person like walked out or said anything although how do you how do you say anything? How do, how do you say anything to yeah. that panel lineup? Like, <laughs> but 
during the Q&A, um, an audience member asked them, what is the best Luke Skywalker moment in any story? And Barbara said, I'm not familiar enough with all of the stories to give a super informed answer to this audience. I was going to push, but I don't that like you said, whatever she's doing, keep doing it. And then the rest of them said stuff that wasn't legend. Stackpole's favorite moment is the one X-Wing at the end of The Mandalorian. Of course, it involves an X-Wing uh, when Luke of shows course, up to the baby. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course, Michael Stackpole would say it something involving the next way <laughs> and like then michael kogi's was the end of the force awakens because he wrote the junior novel for the force awakens and he he had read the moment but to see it was so striking but stover turned into kind of a little kid uh for the second time in the panel the first time was before we got up there when he told me he might fight stackpole and i had to keep them separated but he he said my favorite moment is when luke skywalker shows up at the end of the last jedi and just with his face he says you really thought i was gonna stoop to fight you <laughs> oh and, but it was so interesting to hear those guys praise the new stories so much like it's all star wars man we're just having fun like if you don't like the new stuff that's fine but take Take a breath. Like Randy said in the writing panel one time, you know, a guy who was fed up about inconsistencies and this and that. The advice he got from an editor at Lucasfilm was, hey, don't let Star Wars ruin your life. <laughs> As this is a longer, more involved story, but I, I do remember the context of this was it was a guy who was so concerned about all of these quote unquote plot holes and quote unquote inconsistencies and actually cornered Randy Stradley yeah. and uh, eventually another editor from Lucasfilm to try yeah. to pitch them these ideas and the advice yeah, he was given was don't let Star Wars ruin your life. This guy yeah. goes on to have like a pretty good life and he connects <laughs> with the editor later and he's like, yeah, no, you were right. Like, yeah. No, and I, I, I have to say, too, that, like, my experience and, like, I, if I'm not sure, like, when, when we're going to get the footage from the panel or if we're going to upload it as an episode, we're going to try it. I don't yeah. know if it will come out prior to this or after this or what have you, but there was never a point, too, for me as, like, an openly gay man walking around this convention feeling terrifically unsafe. There was never so a glad. point where I was like, I need to be concerned about any of these people. Even at SWCA, there were some people walking around that I'm like, mm, I'm a little bit concerned about yeah. this. I, you know, I had some concerns leading up to the panel. And then when I got yeah. there and I, the first day and I saw like the general vibe of the convention, I was like, oh, I'm going to be fine. I'm yeah, going to be mean, fine. Because we had gotten yeah. like some nasty grand comment on Twitter and I had been like, oh, Mm. Uh, but then I got there and it was perfectly fine. And we had great attendance at the panel. Uh, yeah, people like seemed packed. to enjoy themselves. Yeah, it was pretty for for a panel that did not have like Matthew Stover or Barbara <laughs> Hamley or uh, Henry Gilroy on it. It was one of the more packed ones that I saw that was oh, yeah. just like Although, a fan one. Don't sell yourself short because didn't you have Abel volunteer to come? We on had the panel Abel volunteer. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so. Abel, Abel Pena, who wrote for Star Wars Insider for like 20 years, he oh, wrote yeah. the history of the Mandalorians. He wrote uh, just a lot of like reference material stuff. He saw on the thing, it was going to be Catherine, the cons executive director and myself. We're going to do this panel. And so Abel sends Catherine an email like the day before. And I was like, hey, so one of the characters I wrote in like 1995, I did publish an article in 2003 that implied he was gay and like or at least bisexual or pansexual and i would like to come on and talk about that experience and he had also done some writing for jahani's companion guide that the original he had tried to write some stuff into the companion guide to more explicitly confirm that she was a lesbian uh, and that had gotten excised somewhere in the editing process and so he sent Catherine an email and was like, hey, I'd love to sit on this panel. I was like, absolutely fucking yes, Abel can come yes. sit on the panel. Then the first day I had to run over to Starbucks on my lunch break, whip out my laptop and change the PowerPoint. <laughs> That's where I disappeared <laughs> to on the first day. Uh, but yeah, it went really well. Uh, it was me and uh, Catherine and Abel. Abel had to duck out about halfway through. We uh, didn't have time for questions, but we made it through the whole PowerPoint. Nice. And the crowd was very receptive. Like people were clearly loving the conversation. Uh, nice. Catherine and I had a really good banter going on. It was just, it was it was great. And like, that's, that's an experience I was nervous about going into it. And once I got there on the first day, and I saw kind of what the organizers were doing, uh, sort of the friendly vibe, I was talking to some people and I was like, Oh, okay, yeah. this is gonna be a lot calmer than I yeah. was expecting. Uh, 
And I said something at, at the end of the panel that, that I'll sort of repeat here because it's sort of my, my thesis statement for people. The, the point I made at the end of the panel, because we go through all the queer characters in Legends, there's not that many. And I sort of made the point at the end of that panel, I said, look, don't let the fact that, you know, there's not a lot of good representation in these stories from 30 years ago dissuade you from reading them, that there's still value in them, that queer kids like myself and Catherine and Andy and others that I know of who were Legends fans still read these stories and resonated with them. And these themes of found family and against fighting back against oppression, fighting back, doing the right thing in a galaxy that's not necessarily on the right course uh, overall, all of those are still really resonant stories. And that was a cool moment that I got to say this to yeah. this room full of people. <sighs> And I, I just, it, it was a great time. It was an, it that, was an absolutely yeah. fantastic time. I'm, I'm glad that felt that way about the con, because I think you're the first person that I've talked to who wasn't on the planning team, because as you can imagine, like a we're lot recording of conversations this about two that. days after the con ended, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ryan's yeah, yeah, yeah. a champion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, yeah, I'll do the Death Star episode with mm. you. We can do it really quick. And I'm like, yay, we're recording yes. this two days after. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is fresh. This is fresh. This is no, you, fresh. Yeah, you, you hit it on the head. And that was the goal because so much of the Legends community, so to speak, and I use the word community very loosely. Big air here. quotation marks in the, yeah. the Zoom call. It's just, um, it's just, uh, there's a lot of people using it as a weapon against what they feel is quote unquote wokeness at Disney when like it like y'all are in the wrong place like star wars was never for you to be clear like and that we had to work against that we had to work hard against that because early on a lot of those people were like yeah legends con and then they went to the website and they were like what do you mean you have a diversity and equity and inclusion officer on staff <laughs> oh horrible news about doing? horrible news for you guys about the con who the con's executive director is <laughs> horrible <laughs> news. yes that i think that like came up at one point like our, our executive director also founded queer con at western washington university and she and Pride Squadron. Pride, yes, Pride Squadron, which is an LGBTQ advocacy group within like the 501st and the Rebel Legion and that community of costume groups. Like this was never for you if you use Legends as a weapon. This was, yeah, this was yeah, about, was... yeah, saving what we love. Exactly. They don't like that movie, but saving what we love. They don't like that love. movie, but I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Oh, yeah, man, uh, it was great. I'm glad it, you could come party. Thank you. Yeah. It was it was fantastic. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of space up front to talk about it that turned into a lot of space up front. Oh yeah, to talk I'm, I'm about sorry it. about that. I yeah. I <laughs> no, that was partially hours. on me. That was partially on me. But speaking of legends uh, yeah. and things that I like about legends, uh, we're here to talk about a novel today. A novel yeah. about the Death Star. Oh uh, yeah, we're going the there. Death Star, uh, called Death Star. <laughs> yeah. Surprising no one. <laughs> Ryan, would you like some additional information about the novel Death Star? Lay it on me because I was just thinking I forget when it came out. And I, I Good, just I'm remember about to reading tell you. it. Yeah, go. Uh, Death Star, per Wikipedia, was a Star Wars Legends novel first published in hardcover by Del Rey on October 16th, 2007. Does not have an audiobook that I could find. Probably just, I don't think it's been like updated by Del Rey yet. Uh, they've been slowly no. releasing audiobooks. They haven't yeah. gotten to this one, but I'm sure they will. I hope it so. Was, it was co-written uh, by Mike. Michael Reeves and Steve Perry. Michael Reeves uh, wrote the MedStar duology for the Clone Wars, which is actually relevant. A character from the MedStar duology, uh, Uli, shows up in That's this. right. And talks about Barriss Afi a lot. Yeah. It's a little awkward in hindsight. Uh, <laughs> but he also wrote some of the Coruscant Knights books for Legends. He wrote a book called Shadow Games. He wrote Darth Maul Shadowhunter. And hilariously published February 26, 2013, wrote a novel called The Last Jedi. That's right. That was one of the, uh, wasn't that connected? No, that wasn't connected to Coruscant Knights. That was its own thing. That was. I, th I think it shared some characters with Coruscant it Knights. It did. It did. It was, uh, it was originally going to, oh, here we go. It was originally going to be the fourth Coruscant Knights novel and it's now right. just a standalone follow-up. Uh, yeah. Right. So I found it hilarious that he wrote a novel called The Last Jedi. Steve Perry is the other author. He wrote the Shadows of the Empire novel. Uh, he also co-wrote uh, Med Stars 1 and 2. And that's the extent of what he's done for 
uh, Star Wars. And I mean, to uh, be fair, Death Shadows Star. of the Empire was massive. Shadows of the Empire was massive. One day I really should do a podcast, but I got to convince Bradley to experience Shadows of the Empire in some form. I don't oh, know. You if have you... To, and it's some form because it was a video game, a novel, a symphony. Everybody forgets the symphony. There's a soundtrack. A yeah. It's a, but it's a, it's, they're, they're very specific in the liner notes. Like this is not a soundtrack to the novel or the video game. This is a, a symphony orchestra, 45 minute thing telling the story through music, which it's, it's a film does. soundtrack, like the film soundtrack. That's what's yeah. going on. I always thought that they should, um, if they were going to have the high Republic basically follow in shadow of the empire's footsteps, they should just do an officially licensed, like yes. soundtrack. However, there's a creator named Grushkov who has done full soundtracks for really? the three adult High Republic novels. Yeah, oh, they do. Cool. They, they're they actually the music that we use in For Light and Dice uh, is Grush Oh, Cups right on. For the High yeah, Republic. Yeah, yeah. They have done full soundtracks for Light of the Jedi, Rising Storm, and Fallen Star is interesting because they mash up Fallen Star and Midnight Horizon. And they've okay. also done like half an album on phase two. Anyway, we got to talk about Death Star. And as far as I can find, that is the additional information I have on Death Star. Ryan, what did you what what did you think of the novel Death Star? What was your recollections of, of this book? Oh man. I mean, I I loved that it was so parted out. There are there, I think there's 13 characters listed as main characters. It's I came to this book in high school. I think I was in like 10th or 11th grade, and it was the perfect book to crack open during a 45 minute study period and just like get a couple chapters about Mima Ruth's and her cantina and, or like and then you would finish that and then next study hall you'd be able to open it and read about uh, Silot Ratu Adil the plant man and get through that <laughs> but <laughs> he was fun the, the proto Tayseret as I was yes. thinking as I was rereading the book I was like oh I know where Tayseret comes from Yes. Yeah, it was so like, it was just little slices of life on the Death Star and things that you didn't really think about. And just people who you would not, like you don't think about the people in the heart of the machine as being oppressed. Their lives all sucked, man. Like everybody, even Tarkin, like everybody oh, was yeah. under the thumb of Palpatine, even if they didn't know it. The the relationship, because Tarkin and Vader are major characters in this novel. Yeah. They spend so much time with Tarkin and Vader. Essentially it retells A New Hope and ends up retelling A New Hope from Tarkin and Vader's point of view. The relationship they have, which is far more adverse Serial. If you read like Tarkin from the new canon or Lords of the Sith or the Tarkin one shot, this is completely different. Yeah. The relationship they have and what uh, the two authors have chosen to do is show just how backstabbing and scheming and just cruel that the Imperial bureaucracy is. And like Tarkin doesn't trust Vader. Vader doesn't trust Tarkin. Madi's over here. Dala is involved in this plot. Yeah. And she's also here. <laughs> I forgot she was in this so much. She's in this. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I do know that like when this novel originally came out, it was kind of a bit of like fix it fit for the oh, entire yeah. EU up to that point because I was reading it and I was like, oh, there's a reference to the breakout. Uh, for our listeners who who maybe are not familiar with the EU, the EU couldn't really decide who stole the Death Star plans. Yeah. It had a little bit of a problem figuring that out. And so in this book, part of what they do is they're explaining like, how do the plans end up away from the station to where Kyle Katarn can retrieve them? How do a, another copy of the plans get to Leia? on the Tana V4 through the events of Battlefront 2, the Legends game, not the Micropayments Hell that I'm told is a good game, but uh, I- It played, got a lot better. Around the I time played Solo. one, I, I heard that, uh, but this book ties all that together. And even yeah. things like, I was reading a little bit of trivia. There's a bit in A New Hope where Vader just disappears from the fighter battle. Hmm. I'm not going to spoil the end of this book. Yeah, no. Because to spoil the end of this podcast episode, I do think people should go read this book. But this book explains where Vader was. And it even tries to explain, like, why Admiral Dalla was written as being, like, such a competent military officer. And then when she turns up again later in the EU, she's making terrible decisions. It's because she gets a head wound in this. That's right. That's she gets, right. gets, like, a piece of metal embedded in her <laughs> head and they have to do, like, surgery. So it was trying to go along. It was almost kind of trying to do what Abel Pena did. I was about to say stories is it, try to yeah. explain not 
retcon these events in the sense of or write them, but retcon them in the way that they make logical sense while still yes. telling a good story. And it does tell a good story. Not to go back to Legends Con, but I'd love to go back to Legends Con. In the How to Write Star Wars Good panel, Randy really harped on the fact that what we call fix it fix, like that's not Star Wars, but this was. Like it, I felt like it paid, it it played, it sampled all the hits just enough. Like it it mentioned the breakout from Battlefront with the Padawan and it it dealt with um the planet despair shows up. You know, it it, it references every story we've There's we've a ever planet had called it, Despair. I know. <laughs> I can't get over it. There's it's a, a prison planet called planet. Despair. <laughs> D-E-S-P-A-Y-R-E. Despair <laughs> the prison planet. <laughs> I forget where that originally showed up. That's I don't old know. EU. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, and there's there's stuff I don't like. I don't love the idea that 500 X-Wings and a Trade Federation battleship once assaulted the Death Star. <laughs> where did you get 500 X-Wings? Uh, the Empire what? War video game, probably. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they spawned them out like it's fucking Battlefront. They built a bunch of mining facilities. I got you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were just running around plopping them on planets like oh, we'll put God. a barracks and we'll put one of yes. those small tank things and then the rest <laughs> of it's just mining shit oh man they didn't know that all you have to do is build a fleet of three snow speeder squadrons and create a raid fleet and get in under the blockade come on y'all send <laughs> everyone you... kenobi with them he can heal He'll mind trip the natives. Come oh, on, talk to oh me. Oh God! Yeah, and General was... Dodonna, give me a call. I'm saying <laughs> that here. If you're a listener, give me a call. I got ideas. We could win this. <laughs> yeah, and and one thing that too that did really strike me was, you know, you keep coming back to the point of a lot of this story is told from the point of view of just ordinary people that are on the Death Star, yeah. and most of them are not even soldiers. No. Uh, Vil Dance and, is a yeah. fighter pilot, like a tie ace. Uh, yeah. How he becomes an ace is a really interesting scene and his reaction to it. Yeah. And then uh, Nova Still. Oh, I like Nova the Still. the other one. Yeah. The, the trooper who, I'm not going to say too much about Nova Still. Uh, no, but we we see him in, uh, we see him in yeah. the movie. Yeah. And yeah. He, he You was... can hear him. He's one of, there's another one, but we'll get to him in a second. Oh, yes, yes. That you can hear in the movie. Uh, but if you listen to the, yeah, you can listen. Some of the lines, uh, they recreate a lot of the lines really faithfully in the book. Yeah. And so some of the troopers, like one of the troopers that's talking when the Han runs in and screams and runs away scene, I think is the one where you can hear Nova still. Yeah. Nova and Nova is interesting because he, I, I got involved with like the Rebel Legion and 501st a couple years after the book came out. Nova was not popular with people who are really into stormtroopers and the Empire and like the different ranks and stuff because the different uniforms that he wears through the books and stuff like do not make sense. Like this guy's in the Navy at one point. He's in the Army at one point. I don't care. He's cool. Maybe he's that cool. Maybe he's special forces. I don't care. The other one that you can hear in the movie, which genuinely I cannot hear unhear this in the movie, is the guy who says stand by oh, in the yeah. final scenes of the film. Oh. And that is a Death Star gunner, or a Death Star uh, CO, actually, gunnery yeah. CO, named Ten Granite. <sighs> CPO Ten Granite. He's C Ten Granite. CPO he's, Ten oh. Granite. All listeners, when I tell you this man's story stuck with me, I first read this book in 2007 when it came out. I loaned the hardcover to a friend of mine and never got it back. So now I have the Legends branded one. Uh, and if that friend is listening to this podcast, which I don't think he is, please give me my hardcover of Death Star back. I know you still have it. I want it back. But I, I first read it in 2007 when it came out. I hadn't dropped off the Star Wars briefly at that point because the Clone Wars movie hadn't come out. And that has stuck with me since then. And rereading yeah. the book to prepare for this podcast episode, I'm sitting here going, oh, this is this is sad. This is still yeah. really sad. The story of that guy. I mean, I don't think it's a spoiler to say like he's a gunnery officer on the Death Star. He's the man who pushes the button. He's the man who pushes the Alderaan button. Uh, and yeah. just what they choose to do with him. It's 
It's kind of like a from a certain point of view story before that was a thing. Yes, I was about to say this whole like, book is. It really is. Yeah, because yeah, you have you have the guy who shouts out at one point in one of the scenes. You have the guy who pushes the button for Alderaan, and then you have Tarkin and Vader and Mahdi all get like substantial chapters. Like Tarkin's a yeah. big part of this book. Yeah, it's, but we were talking about Tangranit. He yes, know, one true love. I love him too. <sighs> He's just what they do with him and the idea of like what's the kind of person who's going to join up with this sort of fascistic cause after the big war has sort of already happened because they had the clone wars and the rebellion everybody's kind of on the fence of whether or not the rebellion is a thing he doesn't join for any sort of like big ideological reason he's he's there for one specific reason and i'm not going to say what it is but how they evolve his character to his final moments which is the standby standby that you hear in the background in the film i would recommend the book for that alone yeah just for that that scene even without the all the other stuff that's going on with the different and the doctor so (laughs) uli who is the doctor i forget his last name um uli uli davini yeah, Uli Davini. So here's the thing. My partner's a nurse. Oh, they. So uh, when I was reading the book, uh, I read part of it at home and I read part of it uh, on break at work the next day. And I kept walking into my partner's room and interrupting him while he was trying to watch YouTube videos to be like, hold on, let me read you this entire scene. I read him one scene that was like two paragraphs of what I thought was just space nonsense. Uh, it was like, we've tried antivirals and anti and uh, we can't get his MCG count over four or whatever. It was some medical nonsense. I walked in and I read that and I was like, did you understand a word of that? He's like, yeah, I mean, I basically got the gist of it. Obviously, wow. we don't have xenobiology, but most of this is pretty accurate. I mean, that makes sense with uh, with these guys having written the MedStar duology. Like, I'm sure talking to professionals was part of their research process. Yeah, I, I wish I had time to do more research because I feel like one or both of them may have a medical background. But all of th- all of that, this book also digs into in a really interesting way too through the characters. Uh, the doctor, the characters that choose a doctor, an archivist, a bartender, a type fighter pilot. Through these characters, it digs into the minutia of what would it actually take to run the Death Star. And not in a sense of Tarkin sitting in those boardroom having meetings. There's one character who's like an architect. Yeah, that's Tila. Tila Cars. Who, who like spots the exhaust port and tries to get them to remove it. And then like just forgets to put the request down in writing. And then they have to switch crew chiefs and the new one installs it anyway. Yeah. And it's this beautiful moment of just stupid bureaucratic bullshit. It's yeah. but the way that they explore, you know, what does it take to run tie divisions? What does it take to run a cantina on the Death Star? What does oh, it yeah. take to run an archive on the Death Star? How would you make that work? It's just a really fascinating look at this station and it's appropriate the book is called death star yeah the cantina especially like mima ruth's and her story and roto the bouncer like oh man i liked her the most that's tw- yeah. I, I yeah i don't know if i liked her the most i also liked uh i don't know i, I like them all like that's the thing they were all such likable people and then they hit you with a scene like nova in the group of troopers that chase han down the hallway and you're like oh that's right we're not supposed to cheer for these guys we're happy when they get shot yeah it's and it never like it never comes down on the side of like all of these people were good from the get-go like some of them were die-hard imperials from the get-go yeah. and a lot of the book is each of them gradually going on their own journey to realizing hey this is bad actually yeah. and some of them get there faster than others uh for a lot of them you know alderaan is the turning point the way they handle the destruction of alderaan in the book and the fallout from that and just the mood shift between yeah everything leading up it's it's just dis- actually it's despair first that they fire on right they fire on despair and the whole vibe kind of changes a little bit like the vibes become a little more rancid yeah. then alderaan happens yeah and it's like oh oh this was bad actually yeah. we, we we shouldn't have done this <laughs> because despair i mean 
despair is a prison planet and most of the people on the death star probably had themselves convinced that everyone who's been convicted and sent to despair was a bad person that's so they exactly can... what happens yeah they spend so much time rationalizing it exactly and they can and it's easy for them but it's not easy and then alderaan is the first yeah alderaan is like oh no we killed billions of people for no reason yeah we killed them because palpatine wanted to make a point palpatine's presence through this book it's very much, I, I don't want to compare it too much directly to Rogue One because they're very different stories. Yes. Palpatine is kind of handled similarly. He never makes an appearance, but his presence is constantly felt. Both in the upper, like, Tarkin and Vader discussing Palpatine, because both of those guys are, like, one degree removed from the Emperor. Yeah. All the way down to how people talk about him just in conversation or don't talk about him or try not to think about him at all. It's really interesting. This this is a book about the Death Star, but it's also kind of a book about the Empire, the, yes, the Legends Empire, and how the Empire functioned or didn't function. And it's fascinating if you if you want to see what the flip side of that looked like. This is a really good book for getting like a just an easy beginning to end story. Here's what the Empire and Legends was like. Yeah, it really is. That's a good that's a good take. It um. And it ends, I feel like it, I mean, it's not a, I don't want to spoil what happens to the Death Star. <laughs> yes, <but> th <laughs> this may come as a surprise, <laughs> what happens to the Death Star at the end of this book. But that's, yeah, and that is the end. And then from there, like, if you, if it's, I never thought of this as a good, like, jumping off point into the Legends Empire. But from there, if you really liked Admiral Dalla, there's a place you can go. Like, if you really liked the Legends Empire, there's a Dark Horse series just called Empire that you can continue to follow average people in the in the empire in that series one of them has a very surprising connection to someone very familiar but yeah it uh, have you read empire i i vaguely remember reading some of empire a long time ago oh man so in a new hope when luke says to owen that's what you said when biggs and tank left the empire comic series very slowly tells you exactly who tank was and is oh yeah oh yeah that's See, a good one. the lovely yeah. thing about legends is i've been reading legends books if you count glove of darth vader i've been reading legends books since to. about 1997 or 8 yeah i think well why oh uh, yeah it was easily it was maybe it was a little bit after that it might have been about 2000 2001 that i was reading stuff outside of outside of like movie direct movie tie-ins and things like that i'm still discovering stuff i have a i have a yeah. shelf over here over a hundred legends books on it and i'm still discovering stuff from legends that i haven't had the chance yes. to experience but if you this book i would say you know revenge of the Sith is one i would say i would hand to somebody who's never read a star wars novel before yes. and say this is what a star wars novel can do now it is the best one and it's basically all downhill from here you will never achieve this again. But Death Star is one that if you're somebody who has read all of the, like a bunch of canon books, if you've read from a certain point of view, if you've read Lost Stars, if you've read all of these tie-ins, if you've read like Moving Target, all of these books, and you're like, well, I kind of want a good jumping off point for Legends, Death Star makes a great one because you can read it and not know what the hell anybody's talking about and just connect with the characters. And then if you're like, what was that bit about the Jedi that broke out? Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Battlefront 2, the original one is, is on GOG, last I checked. Uh, you yes. can download and play it. Uh, if yeah. you want to, yeah, the, what you were saying, if you, if you were like, what happened to Dala? She was just sort of spirited off. She's not anywhere near here when the Death Star blows up. There are some books you can read. Some. There's a lot of books you can read actually oh, yeah. that will explain who she is. Yeah. So, and there's so much. There is so much to dive into. Well, I, I guess I'll I'll bring us around. I, I've been doing final thoughts a little bit differently when it comes to these legends material. And and Ryan, I'll ask you, why should people read this book? People should read this book because even if they're a little thrown by like despair instead of Jetta or this or that, with so many characters, everybody is relatable. We didn't talk about a tour right in the uh, right in the librarian named. We writing. can't talk about every character in this book. No, I know they're we so good. Can't. <laughs> but who who among us hasn't like just felt like they don't belong at their job and they're you know they're they're not. I mean, to say he's not fitting in is to trivialize it. But it, even though they're in these fantastic situations, like they're so relatable, and that's one of the most generic things I could say. But people should read this book because. 
of everything we just said. I mean, it's a great primer on the Legends Empire. I don't. Yeah, I I think that for me, I I'm I'm gonna agree wholeheartedly. It's the relatability of the characters. For me, it was uh, Uli Davini. Uh, when oh yeah. Not only is he put upon, uh, his boss is kind of annoying. Yes. He's very... overworked. He's understaffed, uh, and he's constantly thinking about like almost kind of romanticizing his past career when he was working alongside the Jedi in the Med Star unit. You don't have to have read those books no. to be affected by somebody who's gotten to a later point. Their career hasn't gone how they wanted. They got screwed over by the system. And now they're just beaten down and dejected. And then they meet someone, I won't say who, who puts them back on this path to helping others. That's that's something relatable you don't even have to know. It's such an excellently written series of character studies that intertwine with each other. And yeah. and that's at the end of the day, that's what makes a good Star Wars story, according to a panel of Randy Stradley, Jason Fry, and Henry fucking Gilroy. Yes. It's about the characters and the theme. And even though this book purely exists to tie together a bunch of Legends Loose Ends, it really remembered it's about the characters, it's about the themes of Star Wars. Yeah. I feel like they were handed an assignment that could have been one of the worst Star Wars books possible. And if you read the first review of it on the Force.net, where it got a 0 0.4 out of 4, <laughs> which is a ridiculous number to give any... That is what? an insane 4. number to give this book. Yeah, it could have been what that reviewer wrongly thought it was, but instead it, it really is just a piece about these people in the literal like heart of the beast, heart of the machine. Um, speaking of that panel, we should finally tell them what we alluded to earlier, the secret document. We should at least tell them what it okay, is. Okay, we'll tell because them because we sent you is. where did we send you the library to print out 75 copies okay. of this thing? So I walked in day two of the panel. We'll end the <laughs> end with the story about Legends Con. Yeah. Day two, Ryan pulled me aside day one and said, Hey, are you planning to come to the How to Write Star Wars Good panel? And I said, I mean, yeah, probably. And he goes, So what, Randy so, Stradley. <laughs> the night before with him. The night before he emails me and he's like, I've been thinking about this. And the panel was his idea. And he emails me and he's like, and it's an email. It's a, it's the kind of email chain that when I read the, when it started and I read the, the recipients, I was like, Oh, I should not be here. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's like, I've been thinking and should I provide the uh, six pages of guidelines that I gave all the Star Wars writers who pitched to Lucasfilm at Dark Horse uh, back in the day? Should I just give that to the audience and then we can go from there? And before I even see this, Henry Gilroy has responded like, People wanted to get their hands on this at, at Lucasfilm. Like, what? And I said, yeah, let's do it. Send it over. So, yeah. The next, sorry, so send continue. it over. The next day, Ryan pulls me aside and says, hey, are you going to come to the How to Write Star Wars Good panel? And I say, I mean, yeah, I was, it was one of the ones I was looking at. He's like, well, we have this document that I just found <laughs> out we're going to have last, last night. That's the original document that was given to all the writers who were going to pitch to give them a primer on what they could and could not do. It was the rules for writing Star Wars at Dark Horse at this point. Yeah. And I was like, as an aspiring Star Wars writer, uh, absolutely, please give me this document. Yeah. The next day I roll up, it's about 10 o'clock. Uh, my <laughs> panel several hours later. So my plan is I'm going to show up, go to a panel, walk around, et cetera. And I walk by the desk and I see Catherine, uh, who's the executive director of the con and my co-panelist. So I walked up just to say, hello, I am here. Everything is good. See you at the panel. And she's like, Charles, do you have a car? <laughs> and I said, I do have a car. And she goes, would you be willing to use that car? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> As a production background, a guy who has run multiple live events, if I have to be deputized for a thing, I'm going to I'm going to say yes. Hands down, this is a thing of mine. Uh, if I'm not doing anything like urgent, I'm absolutely good to be deputized. And so basically, uh, long story short, thanks to some assistance from Virginia, who was graciously provided us some directions uh, to the fastest way to get the staples. Uh, I yes. actually was the one who went down and printed all of these copies off. Oh my God, uh, Virginia uh, from Imperial Communique, the mm -hmm. action figure. I did not was know walking that. by. Oh, I got to text her after this. And oh she my was God. like, she was like, oh, you're trying to get to the staples. And oh, I'm like, I gotta thank yeah. Her. And she's like, okay, you go here and here and here and here and here. 
Amazing. <laughs> and I, I didn't even use, I didn't even use maps. I just followed it. It took me straight there. I went in, I printed the stuff out. I got it in the box. I came back and I dropped it off and I went to go, uh, set up for the, well, I wandered around for a minute at first, I think. And then I went in to do my panel. And so I was actually the one that printed all of those off. And That's then amazing. I, I got my copy of them. I, I think I marched into this you room did. with Henry Gilroy and everyone in it. I was like, where's my fucking document, Ryan? <laughs> you said that. You yelled that. <laughs> where's my, I don't think I said fucking. I was like, where's my document, you, Ryan? You did. You did say that. <laughs> I did say fucking. Where's my no, fucking document? No, 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 You just said, where's my document? And I Where's my you, document, you Ryan? Exactly what you said. <laughs> with like yes. Henry Gilroy and everyone's right there getting ready. Oh, yeah. Like, this, that was, was the best part. Promise this. These were small panel rooms. Like oh, this yeah. was not. Yeah, that was the beauty of it all. But yeah, yeah. I felt like I was in the room with like you were. I I was, but I felt like I was right there, like sitting at a table, listening to Jason Fry and Randy Stradley and Henry Gilroy, Barbara Hamley, Michael Kogi, uh, Abel Pena. The closest I got because I literally sat at a table with Abel Pena. You did, and Matthew Stover. Uh, yeah. My one regret of the con was I did not actually get to meet Matthew Stover. Oh, uh, no. That was my he one was, regret. He, uh, at at a party Saturday night, his badge had broken, and he was like, do you have any tape? And I had some tape. I was on a mission, but I handed him a piece of tape. And later he was like, hey, thanks for the tape. And I was like, hey, thanks for the Revenge of the Sith novel. Like, what do you, <laughs> what do you say? Like, you can't just say you're welcome. <laughs> And I, yeah, I was like, it's it, yeah, it's the only novelization that I would say is better than the movie. And then the man immediately was like, no, no, George told that story that I just and I was like, I know. OK, yeah, you're right. Okay. I did attend two, his, the whole package. I did attend this panel, but I had literally just recorded our Revenge of the Sith episode with Andy. <sighs> The day before, it was two days before. We recorded Thursday night, and then it was at oh, Legends no. Con on Saturday. And every time I walked by Matthew Stover, I was like, I know for a fact. Andy and I just spent 45 minutes giving this man's book a fucking tongue bath. <laughs> I cannot oh, go man. talk to him. <laughs> you had to. You I, had to. I, that was my one regret, is I did not get to talk to Matthew Stover at all. Uh, well, next time. Next, next time it's coming. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Knock on wood. Absolutely. Ryan, is there anything other than Legends Con, uh, which you can follow at Legends underscore Con on Twitter, uh, to get updates on that? Is yes, there anything please else do, please do. you would like to plug? Uh, Force yes. Friends Rewatch, I know, is kind of on hiatus right now. Yeah, a little bit. We're just so busy. But you can follow us at Force Friends Pod on Twitter and get Andy's hot takes about everything Star Wars. They are excellent as always. You could check out Lazy Day Galaxy on Instagram for my t-shirts and such. Uh, we had a really cool tote that we debuted at Legends Con. We're currently kind of rebranding. We're going to move to the Etsy space and stuff. Mike from Hyperspace Props, who was our boot neighbor who you should also check out because he has amazing in-universe like card games and also currency with his wife emily they run it they do amazing work he's kind of coaching us on like making it a more viable brand so check us out cheer us on as we grow and yeah that's about it and if you go to lazy day uh was the lazy day galaxy yes sir you can maybe get statues of revan but not that the was, one that oh. I have. <laughs> that was a uh, Phantom Forge. We partnered with them. They're like prop making and like home decor. We partnered with them at the booth. They had this uh, like almost black series scale Revan statue. But due to a machine malfunction a uh, week before Legends Con, they had three like collapsed Valley of the Dark Lords tomb style Revan statues like sunken in a sand base. And we pressured Charles for a day and a half. To day buy and a half. Them. Okay, because, I, I, I will, yeah, he bought you I bought promise, number three of three, right? Yeah, yeah. I I promise, Bradley, this is not going to turn into an hour and thirty minute episode, but I do have to tell this story too because it's Please. one of my favorites from Legends Con. This was early on, so I basically didn't know anybody there except Ryan and Catherine when I first got there, and I was walking around and I was meeting people, and I I walked around to this booth which which Ryan was doing shifts at, and one of the guys, Tyler, was the one who had made these statues. Is that right? Yes, uh, Tyler, Tyler the made the statues. Made Phantom Forge props. You can find and, them. On and Again, they're like these Jedha style uh, Valley of the Dark Lords, like Revan statues. What he had done is he had put them on a, a wooden base and he had done a resin and then he'd done like, like a coating to make it look like sand, like the sand blasted. I don't even like Revan that much. I think he's interesting-ish in Knights of the Old Republic. 
I don't think he's that interesting of a character outside of Knights of the Old Republic, but I, I really agree. loved the looks of these statues. I thought the idea of a sandblasted Revan statue that had fallen into the ground was such a cool thing. And so I kept walking by these statues because I didn't want to commit to spending money. First it was, I don't want to spend money this early in the con. And then it was, well, I'm not 100% sure about this. And by day two, it had just turned into a running joke of I would walk by the booth and I'd be like, there's two of them. One of them sold very quickly, uh, but the other two stayed there and it would be a running joke. And at one point I was like, well, if somebody comes up and buys the, the second one, I'll probably buy the one that's left. And I'm standing at the booth and it's about halfway through day two. And another, um, I f forget his name, Austin? Austin was the Revan cosplayer. He just, I'm standing there and we're doing our back and forth. And he walks up and he's like, yeah, I'll take one of those while I'm standing right there. <laughs> I didn't know he had bought one. And I turned and looked at him. I went, I'm so mad at you right now. <laughs> you have no idea what you've just done. <laughs> Austin loves Revan more than anyone I know. So I love that he just casually. He just casually that. walks great. up, buys the other one. And I'm like, okay, yes, now I will buy the. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, Austin also had a kick-ass. Um, yeah. For everyone who was in the Four Light and Dice Discord, the photo of the Lego Excess uh, Freighter that I shared, that was Austin. Yeah, um, Sky Guy Brick Ranch. Sky Guy on, Brick uh, Ranch yeah. on, on Instagram. Yeah, he had uh, three different Legends novels. One of the Jedi Quest books, uh, one of the Thrawn trilogy, and not a novel, but Knights of the Old Republic. He had scenes in Lego. So cool. Anyway. Yes, they were fantastic. But he bought the the second Revan statue, and then I bought the third one. Uh, so it is now sitting at my desk, uh, and then Tyler also threw in a coaster. So now I have a Sith wow, Empire that's awesome. coaster. So that's the story of how I ended up with a sandblasted Revan statue on my desk at work. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, that was so cool. Thank you for that stopping was, by the booth. It's 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 a thing with cons is if you keep seeing the same people, especially with a small con, you get those running jokes going. Yes. And it's something that just it can't be replicated. No, uh, he was he was going to prank you, by the way. At one point, he was like, we were a little slow. The vendor room was slow. There were like three really good panels going on. So he was watching. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Always. The panels, the panels were the highlight. But he was watching the edges of the aisle. And if he would have seen you, he was going to hide the Revan statue and <laughs> tell you they were gone and then use your anguish to be like, I was kidding. But if you're that upset, like, let's go. Let's make a deal. Shout out to everybody at that booth. That was hilarious. <laughs> Thank you. We were fun. That was we had hilarious. A uh, well, you can check out Ryan uh, again at uh, Legends underscore Con on Twitter to follow Legends Con. Yeah. Uh, Force Friends Rewatch, wherever you yes. get your podcasts, as well as at Force Friends Pod on Twitter. Uh, and you can follow Lazy Day Galaxy on yes, Instagram sir. to see what's going on with that Which ryan shirts. thank you for coming to talk yeah about an episode of what was ostensibly supposed to be about death star <laughs> i mean we talked about it about we did we did in fact talk about death star which everybody <laughs> with an interest in star wars books should go and read absolutely uh, and bradley yeah bradley you, so you may run the socials now <laughs> bradley i'm so sorry <laughs> Thank you for listening to Gold Squadron Gaze. Did Charles fuck something up? Send us a message at goldsquadrongaze at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at Gold Squad Gaze. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Gold Squadron Gaze. Subscribe to us on YouTube at Gold Squadron Gaze, where we post the podcast as well as exclusive content. Please join us next week and every week for more of Gold Squadron Gaze. We're recording to the cloud so Bradley can edit because God knows I'm not going to do it. <laughs>